ya había que ir a de ser. Okay, good morning. I thought we'd start today's lecture with some music just to get the energy up because it is quite early in the morning. So, um, yeah, so I thought I need that. Maybe you needed that too. Okay, this is a quality song. Mr. Grunewald, do you know this song? I will be very impressed if you know this song because it is actually, I think it is like Norwegian or Swedish or something like that which means I have no idea what they are singing. They might be singing about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I don't know, but I like the beat. Okay. Um, okay, let's start. So today we are, uh, what we're going to do today, we're going to look at um, uh, specifically example three. So in the video, I hope you all watched that prep video. So in the prep video, um, we uh, went through the formulas that IS-12 gives us um, that we use to calculate the tax base of an asset and a liability. So now we are going to put that into practice and we are going to do example three. So um, in your notes, notes and class examples, you can follow along in, uh, with that for your example three. Um, know that, uh, oh, oh, I didn't uh, load any slides for you uh, for this uh, lecture for today because we are actually just going to through some examples, so you'll be able to make your notes there and, and, and follow with that. Um, so there's nothing new or weird on my slides that you don't already have in prior videos or um, uh, in your notes. Okay, so that is what we are going to be doing today. Good, so we, um, so what we've done up to now, we looked at what is DFAT tax, and then we've also looked at that, those tax-based formulas. So just to refresh your memory, but you did watch that video, so don't really need to refresh your memories. Um, we said that the tax base of an asset, when we calculate the tax base of an asset, we first have to ask ourselves, is the economic, will the economic benefits be taxable? And if that is the case, if the answer is yes, then that means um, that our tax base will be the amount deductible for tax in future. Whereas if the economic benefits will not be taxable, then the tax base will equal the carrying amount. Now sometimes, you'll see now when we work through the example, this is sometimes a bit of a difficult question um, to answer. So the way that I figured it out for myself is um, if, we also, if we start a business to sell pigs, Okay, so uh, that will be our business. That's our main business now to manufacture pigs and to sell the pigs. Uh, so when we make when we make a profits uh, from selling these pens, then the um, uh, those uh, the profits that we make will be taxable. So that's our main business. That's our main economic event that we that that that's the reason why we started the business. Uh, so everything that we buy, if we buy machinery or if we, if we buy a building or land or whatever, we do all of that because we plan to use that to manufacture the pens so that we can sell them and make profits. Okay, and then when we make those profits, we will be taxed on that. However, we also sometimes have assets and liabilities on our um, uh, financial statements, or specifically our assets, on our financial statements um, that, that actually, um, they are there after the event. So they, we didn't, for example, we, uh, in the video we spoke about debtors. We said that the, the debtors, the economic benefits from a debtor will not be taxable because um, uh, the economic event, the selling of the pens has already happened. Um, so it's after the fact. So, the, so when we have this debtor balance, um, we've already created those economic benefits um, from uh, selling the pens and getting, making the profit. Okay, so, it's, so, so therefore when that um, act of, of debtors realizes in future, um, uh, the economic benefit that we are going to get, which is then the, the cash that we're going to get, uh, we're not going to have to pay tax on that again because we've already paid tax on that again, uh, or, or bef uh, before. So this is sometimes a weird question, but as we do the example, it will make more sense. Then if we get to the tax base of a liability, um, we saw in our little, uh, the formula that they gave us here in paragraph eight in your, your standard, uh, we actually have two uh, different types of liabilities that um, uh, this paragraph addresses how we should calculate uh, the tax base. 
So the first is a normal liability where the tax base will be the carrying amount, less any amounts deductible in future. And then because revenue received in advance is also a, a, a liability, However, obviously it's revenue, so we can't have amounts deductible in future for that revenue. So here the formula changes a little bit. It's the tax base, uh, is the carrying amount less the amount not taxable in future. So that's the formulas that we use. Okay, and then lastly, paragraph nine, they tell us just to watch out, be careful, because sometimes the, we have um, uh, the we had transactions that happened that did not give us assets or liabilities. However, these items still have tax basis. An example they give us here um, is the, um, uh, where do they give that? Yeah, the research costs. Okay, so um, when we get, when we had research costs, we expensed it all in the, um, uh, for accounting purposes, but for tax purposes, we are going to expense it over four years. Okay, so that's an example of that. So now we start with class example three. So please open up your um, your, your class your notes and class examples. Make sure you have that example in front of you. Um, otherwise, you can just follow along and then later on go and look at that example in detail because you'll see. Um, uh, in that example, there are these uh, detailed descriptions of uh, or, or, or explanations for every item. Um, so you can just sit back and listen, eat your popcorn, um, and then later on go and do class example three again on your own. Okay, so are you all with me? Give me, give me, just give me a sign. Three of you. Okay, ready for us to start with class example three. Okay, cool. I need some interaction, please. I'm missing you guys sitting here in front of me. So I just need some um, some interaction there. Cool. Thank you. Now we can start. Okay, so in class example three, what they give us, ooh, best ever. Money I forgot about. Okay, never mind. Um, oh, there's more. I have 13 rand that I didn't know about. Okay, anyway, let's carry on. So um, what they give us in class example three is they provide us with um, a statement of financial position as well as some additional information. And what we have to do um, for example three is we have to go and calculate what the tax basis will be for all of these um, assets and liabilities on our statement of financial position. Now remember we only do this for assets and liabilities, not for equity. Um, uh, because yeah, we only look at our, our assets and liabilities in our deferred tax scale. Because equity is just like a balancing amount of all my assets and liabilities. And remember, we are now trying to calculate what this deferred tax liability or asset should be. Okay, so that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to complete this column. Good, so uh, the first item there that they give us in, on our SFP is property, plants and equipment. And for that, they give us some additional information. So note one in the additional information, they give us ooh, um, information regarding um, the, uh, these items of property, plant, and equipment. And the first one uh, that we have to look at will be land. Okay, so first we look at land. We have to now calculate the tax base of land. Okay, so where do we start? It's an asset. We want to uh, calculate the tax base. So the tax base formula uh, for an asset said that we have to first ask ourselves, will the economic benefits from this land be taxable? So what do you think? Let's see if I can open a, um, a poll. Oh my gosh. I have no idea how to do this. I will have to ask auditing. They know everything. Anyway. Um, never mind, we won't do a poll. So just a few of you, what do you think? Economic benefits, will that be taxable or not? Not taxable, okay. No, no, okay. Okay, so you are telling me that the economic benefits that we are going to get from land will not be taxable. But you agree with me that we are in the business of manufacturing pens these are pens, manufacturing pens and selling them. 
So that's our business. That's our main business. Okay. Now, for us to be able to do this, um, we obviously need. Uh, um, we will have a factory building and factory machinery to manufacture these things. Okay. So if we have land. Where are we going to place this factory building? Are we, how is, it, or is it going to float in the air? Where's that factory building going to be? So can you see that for us to be able to manufacture these pens and um, to sell them and to make profits, we need the land to put our factory building on it. So we would not have purchased the land if we just wanted to stand there and look at it. We purchased the land because we want to use it to manufacture the pens, to sell them at a profit, and when we do that, we are going to pay tax on that profit. So let me ask you again, what do you think? Will the, will the economic benefits that we are going to get from land be taxable? So I'm not asking whether there are any, um, whether I can, whether there are any tax deductions or wear and tear or whatever for land. I'm not asking that. I'm asking that when we realize that land, when we are using that land, we are going to get economic benefits. Okay, and. Um, those economic benefits, what do you think? Do you think that those benefits will be taxable? Okay. Yes, okay. So the benefits will be taxable then. Yes, they will. Yes, uh, benefits, yes, but no such deductions. I agree. We're going to get to that. But at the moment, I'm just asking you, will the economic benefits that we are going to get from land be taxable? And uh, the answer is yes, they will be taxable. So you need land to have a building, you need the building to make the pens, and then you sell the pens to make profit, which will be taxable. 100%. That is exactly what we are doing. So can you see, like I said, our main economic event, main purpose of our business is to sell the pens. So the land and the factory building, everything that we now got, that we purchased, that we have to use to make these pens, um, that's the main reason why we are doing that. Okay, so we're doing all of that because we are going to have this, these economic uh, events in future where we are going to sell them and then we are going to pay tax on that. Cool, so that means if the economic benefits are taxable, the tax base will be the amount deduct deductible for tax in future. Okay, so um, uh, uh, Mr. Duplessis there says, yeah, but there's no such deductions. And that's true. So therefore, what will, what will the tax base then be for land? So the tax base will be the amount deductible for tax in future. 50 what? I think, well, I think so. Sorry, I, I, I thought that so was a 50. Yes, yeah, so the, the tax base will then will be zero because my future deductions will be zero. I'm, I'm not going to get any tax deductions for that land. Okay, for specifically for the, the economic benefits that the land will contribute to. Okay, no, no tax deductions there. So that means in our deferred tax calc, um, we will uh, have the following. We'll, we'll have our land, then we'll have a carrying amount of 380,000. Tax base will be zero, giving us then a temporary difference of 380. Now, how do you feel about that temporary difference? Does that bother you that we are saying there's a temporary difference between accounting and tax for land? Do you, do you think there's a um, there's a temporary difference? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Okay, none of you answering my question. You think this does this feel right? Temporary difference. So remember, we said that uh, temporary differences are when the um, over time the accounting and the tax treatment will be exactly the same. It's just the timing that differs. Well, do we have that for land? Let's look at what our current tax calculation will look with regarding to land. We don't have, we won't have any depreciation. We don't have any wear and tear. So if this goes on forever and ever and ever, we are never going. To, it doesn't seem like there are any differences between um, uh, tax and accounting. Do you agree? Okay. So um, does it therefore make sense? that we have this temporary difference. There's not a timing difference because it will never be the same. Now, the land will not be depreciated, so the carrying amount will remain the same should the land be carried under the cost model. Exactly, yes. Uh, land will not be depreciated, and there's also won't also be any wear and tear allowances. 
Um, what will happen if land gets a revaluation in the future? Hey, wait a minute. Don't be so hasty. We're going to get that. We're going to get there. Okay, you can't, we can't do everything now, but we will get there, I promise you. When we get to our I-16 lecture in two weeks' time, we will address that. Okay, but for now, just a um, um, uh, uh, cost model. Okay, cool. So you agree with me that this does not make sense. This worries us a little bit. Okay. However, don't worry about it too much because... Oh, now the sound failed me. Just put on the sound a little bit louder. Oh, man. Sound up, volume up. Okay, so this is to be continued. This, we, we will, we, I'm going to get back to this um, uh, in today's lecture still. But what we do about this weird temporary difference that we have over here. Okay, cool. Oh, let's just play the sound again for fun. Anyway, next. Okay. Um, the next asset that we have is DJ in the house. Yes. Oh, Mr. Duplessis, you don't you just don't know nothing. Um it, it, it's a little bit weird. In, in my previous lectures, always we used to always have these spontaneous dancing sessions, um, which I'm not going to do because that means I'm going to be the only one standing here and dancing um, in front of the camera, which will look weird when you repost that to um, uh, Instagram. Please don't do that. Okay, so, but anyway, but there will be a lot of music because I really love music. Good, so factory building. Let's hope we can get back onto campus, then we can all spontaneous dance together. Okay, so for the factory building is our next asset. And here they tell us that um, uh, South African Revenue Services grants the following allowances. For the factory building, we get 5% per annum on the original cost, not prorated. Okay, so uh, we have purchased this factory building on the 1st of January 20X4. Uh, so that means we are now at the end of 2014, I think. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. And end of 13. Oh gosh, I can't remember. Where's our, where's our trial balance? Sorry, now I can't remember the date. Yes, 2013. Good. So we purchased this um, uh, building on um, the 1st of January 2004. We've now had it for 10 years. Um, and that is why that's our accumulated appreciation, giving us our carry. So, question we have to ask ourselves to determine the tax base, firstly, is will the economic benefits be taxable? So, what do you feel about that? How do you feel about um, uh, factory building? Will the economic benefits be taxable? Yes. Okay. Mr. Mangali, thank you. You were the first one. Uh, yes, they will be. Okay, so that means then if the economic benefits will be taxable, then our tax base will be the amount that will be deductible for tax in future. Okay, so we now know that we've already had this asset, we've, we've now had this asset for 10 years, and we get, um, uh, uh, we get a 5% per annum uh, uh, allowance um, uh, on the cost. Okay, so now firstly I saw that question a little bit earlier. Um, yes, we will tell you what the, the periods or the percentages are um, uh, for which these assets will be, um, uh, for which an allowance will be granted by such. Okay, so we will give you this information. And you'll see sometimes we make up our own tax law if we want to um, address a certain specific aspect. Okay, so um, we're not really integrating that much with the tax on third year. You'll do that next year in CTA. Uh, okay, so we we get 5% per annum. Now, 5% per annum equates to 20 years. So 20 years times 5% gives me 100%. Okay, so we've already had this asset for, for 10 years. That means there will be 10 years remaining, 10 years worth of um, allowances remaining. So the amount that will be deductible for tax in future will be our carrying amount less the 10 years deduction that we've already received, and that gives me then the 10 years deduction that is remaining. 
Okay. Uh, so that's our tax base for the factory building. If we now put that into our deferred tax calc, um, then we see we've got our carrying amount for the factory building, our tax base will be 900,000, and that gives us a temporary difference. Okay, and that now makes sense. Do you, do you agree that this temporary difference makes sense? Because in the end, we are going to um, uh, 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 we are going to ex expense the full uh, carrying amount, the full cost of this asset. Uh, through depreciation for accounting purposes, and we are also going to get the full cost of um, the factory building as wear and tear allowances in future. So over time, accounting and tax is the same, however, there are timing differences, so uh, temporary differences, and that's what we have here. Okay, um, yeah, so Mr. Shrimpel, the benefits are taxable and deductions are available regarding taxation, exactly. Good. So our next asset that we have is our office building. So they tell us for the office building there will be there are no tax allowances. Okay, so no tax deductions for our office building. Okay, now we have to determine the tax base. First question is will the economic benefits be taxable? So the economic benefits from our office building, will that be ta taxable? What do you feel about um, the office building's economic benefits. When we realize that office building, when we use it up, we are going to get economic benefits. Will those economic benefits be taxable? Okay, it seems like, um, yeah, we have, uh, oh, Mr. Ocom disagrees with you. Uh, okay, Ms. Dunstan also says yes. So, um, let one of you said yes. Can you maybe convince Mr. Ocom? Tell Mr. Ocamp why you think it will be taxable. Okay, so quickly put in an explanation there. One of you that said yes. Oh, Mr. Lawrence also says no. Mr. Mojapela, or Ms. Mojapela also says no. Okay, uh, Mr. Armstrong is on the right path. Um, he says it's the same concept as the land. Exactly. So even though the, we, we're not manufacturing the pens in the office building, uh, we still need that office building because from this office building we will be paying our uh, our salaries, our um, uh, all our expenses that need to be paid. Uh, we will be uh, we, we we will have the, the the people over there phoning the debtors saying, "Hey, you still owe me money. You have to pay." So can you see that that office building is part of our business? We need that. It doesn't help if we just have a factory building, manufacture the pens. And now what? Who's going to arrange for those pens to get to um, to the customers and to sell that? So the office buildings, organized deliveries, accounting services, sales, etc. Yes. And if, we, if the office building does not pay the salaries, I promise you we will not be making a lot of pens in month two if there are no salaries being paid. Okay, so the benefits will be taxable, but due to no allowances for tax, the tax base will be zero. Perfect. Why is the tax base zero? If you think about our formula, so, so and that's the right way to think about it. So you're already thinking um, uh, that the tax base will be zero, but you'll see now if we apply our formula, it says that the tax base will be the amount that will be deductible for tax in future because the economic benefits are taxable. Therefore, for the office building, because we are not receiving any allowances, the uh, tax base will be zero. Okay, um, so that means if we put that into our deferred tax calc, again, we'll have a carrying amount, zero tax base, and then we have uh, temporary differences again. So that's weird. Why do we have temporary differences? Because this to me seems like a, 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 a permanent difference, okay? Because for accounting purposes, we are going to have to add back the depreciation um, that, we, that we have every year but there will be no deduction for wear and tear. So can you see that after the 20 years, tax and accounting is not the same. So again, weird that we have this, um, uh, this temporary difference. Okay, so we're a bit worried about that, but don't worry too much because we are going to get to that. Good, so to be continued in part two of today's lecture. Okay, so what do we have next? Next, we have our factory machinery. Um, and factory machinery, they tell us that we get a 15% per annum on cost uh, tax allowance. 
Okay, so um, so basically, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Bassi is just saying uh, basically, if something contributes to a taxable item, uh, the, uh, i.e., the profit, then it has taxable economic benefits. Yes, if we're using that to get to generate profits, then those profits will be taxable. So then, the economic benefits will be taxable. Good, and everything contributes together. Okay, so for these things, it's not just our plastic raw material that contributes um, uh, to this. It's the electricity, it's the, the, the lady in the office paying the salaries and everything that contributes to the, this economic benefits. Okay, so for factory, uh, factory machinery, um, we're getting a 15% uh, per annum uh, um, uh, tax allowance. Um, so we again have to ask ourselves, will the economic be, uh, benefits be taxable? And now hopefully you get that warm, fuzzy feeling. You can see it. Economic benefits will be taxable. So therefore, hmm, something is weird. Okay, now it's better. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so the t tax base will be the amount that will be deductible for tax in future. So at the moment, um, we can see if we work it out, um, Oh my gosh, what am I doing? It is jumping down. Just bear with me for a second. I now made the, um, my touch pad. Put some water on a bit. Never mind. Okay, we can carry on. Um, okay, now we're just a little bit behind. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Send an email to the dean. No, don't. Send an email to your class rep, which you will soon have um, the name and details of. Okay, so factory machinery, uh, we've already had this um, machine for, uh, so the total use for life for accounting purposes is 10 years, and five years of that has gone by. So this asset, we know that this asset is already five years old, so we're still going to get 15% um, uh, tax allowances in future. So therefore, the tax base will be our cost, there's the uh, tax allowances that we've already received, the five years that are passed. That gives us the five years that remain uh, for, for this asset. Good. So machinery, there's our carrying amount. There's our tax base, giving us a temporary difference. And we are, again, we are happy with that uh, temporary difference because it makes sense. Accounting and tax is going to be the same in the end. Um, however, there will be timing differences. Good. Next is a patent, so uh, they tell us it's an other intangible asset, and they now sort of give us the, the tax base of that patent. They say it's 420,000. We don't know, have to worry and go and calculate it, but the principle is still the same. We are going to use this patent. Um, so the patent that we have is for the, the magic ink that goes into these pens. So obviously we need that patent to generate the future economic benefits. Therefore, the amount that will be deductible for tax purposes in the future, they've given to us as 420. Okay, so we also have a, a temporary difference over there. We will be looking at intangible assets later um, during this quarter still. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, what is an example of something that does not contribute to taxable economic benefits? Okay, we, we, we will get to that. Uh, but I see Ms. Dunstan has already answered you. Okay, so, um, yeah, we, we'll get to that. Okay, so just hold your seat. Okay, I'm going to keep you in suspense about that one a little bit longer. Next asset is inventories. So for the inventories, do you think for those inventories, the economic benefits will be taxable in future? What do you think about that one? When, so if we now have these pens in our inventory, we are going to realize these, this inventory by selling it. Okay. So when we sell it, we're going to get revenue in, and we are going to be taxed on that. Do you agree with that? So the economic benefits will be taxable. Therefore, the tax pass will be the amount deductible for tax in future. And because for tax purposes, remember, what we do for tax purposes is, um, I think it's Section 11, it's been quite a while since I had tax, but uh, so, so Section 11 something says that you, um, for tax purposes, you are allowed to deduct all of your um, purchases for the year, 
as well as your opening inventory, but you have to add back your closing inventory. Okay, so you, that means that this closing inventory for this year will be our opening inventory in future, and it will is going to be deducted. So it will be almost like your cost of sales. It's the same calculation as cost of sales, so that's your tax base. Carrying amount tax base the same, no temporary difference. Again, that makes sense because we um, uh, there's no difference between the accounting and tax treatment, no timing differences. Good. General deduction formula. Thank you. I will forget that as soon as I walk out of this menu. Good. So, uh, but you can't because you still have to write tax exam. But I don't. Okay, next. Trade receivables. Okay, who was it? Mr. Armstrong asked that question. Um, uh, what about trade receivables? So, trade receivables, they give us some additional information and they tell us that my trade receivables consist of our trade debtors control account reduced by the balance for uh, the allowance for expected credit losses of 50,000 50, rand. And then they tell us that we get a, a, an allowance of three, uh, uh, a deduction of 25% from of this balance of the allowance for expected credit losses um, each year. Now what I want you to see here, and I want you to make sure that you understand this, is that we will, oh now I can use the doc cam, thank you Linda. Um, that you must always remember, don't, don't, don't get this confused and mess it up. Okay, and this comes from FRK 100 already. I was a lecturer for a few years on FRK 100, so I know you are taught that over there and at school as well. So we will have our, um, our gross debtors. I hope you can see this. So we'll have our gross debtors T account, which will have will always have a debit balance. Okay, so there will always be a de debit balance. Now, my allowance for expected credit losses, okay, remember, don't do this. I will send a, um, a lightning strike to, to hit you when you use um, uh, acronyms like that or abbreviations like that. But just remember that this allowance for expected credit losses will always have a credit balance, okay? And what happens is these two accounts together give us our trade receivables on our SFP. Okay, so our allows for expected credit losses is almost like our accumulated depreciation. So these two accounts always go together. So don't 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 see this as a liability. It's not a liability. It's just an uh, uh, something that decreases the value of our gross debt. So make sure you understand that. Okay, so we're firstly going to look at our gross trade receivables. Now that is an asset and um, uh, a contra asset, a negative asset, yes, something like that. Good. So, but it's actually part of the same asset. We're just keeping it keeping these two um, entries separately to help us with our administration. So that we, because if we now put that Put this credit in here in our gross debtors, then we are almost losing um, uh, that control of who still owes us money. Remember, because this is just what we say, oh, well, we think, we worried about these debtors, this one, this one, this one. So therefore, we are just uh, um, creating an allowance for that. We're not, if we put it over here, it might seem as if we have already written them off, and then the um, people in the office building will not know to phone these debtors and say, hey, you still owe me money just for admin purposes that we keep it separately. Okay, so back to gross trade receivables, the economic benefits. Um, will these economic benefits be taxable? Okay, so now we have to remember, we have to think about what is the economic benefit of the data? What's the economic benefit of a data? Remember now we've already sold our pens to this data and on the date of the sales transaction, we recognize the revenue and, um, and, and we, and therefore we made a profit, and we pay tax on that profit. Okay. So when we realise the rev the data, the only way uh, economic benefits we are going to get will be the cash that we get from from this data. Okay. So um, therefore, that means that the tax base will be equal. Uh, the benef economic benefits will not be taxable because we're not going to pay tax again when they give pay us that cash. So the tax base will be equal to the carrying amount. Okay. So um, uh, yeah, 
gross trade receivables tax base equal to the carrying amount. Now for our allowance for expected credit losses, um, this we because it's got a, cr a credit balance, we're going to just for the tax base purposes treat it as a liability to calculate what our tax base should be. Okay, so um, just for tax basis, we are going to say um, let's treat it like a liability because it's got this credit balance. So for the liability, the formula is that the tax base will be the carrying amount less the amount deduct deductible in future. Okay, so now we have to think what will be, be the amount deductible in future. Now, if you have watched that um, uh, those short little videos that I gave you for the current tax test, then you would have seen um, the, the video for the allowance for expected credit loss. But I've had quite a few queries on that as well, so I just want to quickly um, run through that again. So um, if, we in, if in year one we have our, uh, a gross debtor that we are a little worried about, then we are going to say, okay, let's create this allowance for expected credit losses for this data, and the other layer goes to my movement in allowance for expected credit losses in PL. Okay, so that means for accounting purposes, we expense the full amount of this data in year one. But for tax purposes, what happens for tax purposes? For tax purposes, um, we take the balance of this allowance, and the receiver says, okay, take this balance, but then you are only allowed to get 25% of that balance as a deduction. And then you also have to add back the 25% uh, of the prior year balance, which in this case was zero. Okay, so effectively what that means is for tax, we are getting a 25% deduction in year one. Okay. We're for accounting 100%, tax only 25%. What happens next year when this data now is a bad data and, and we have to take it to credit loss? Well, credit our uh, gross data, take it to credit losses. But now, obviously, uh, because we, we we don't have that data anymore, we also don't need this allowance for expected credit losses anymore. So we also have to zero that out. And that results in our gross data balance being zero for this data, the allowance for expected credit losses being zero, and a zero net effect in profit or loss for tax purposes. So for accounting, we expense the full amount in the prior year when we created this allowance, and the net effect is no deduction in the current year, or no expense in the current year. What happens for tax purposes? For tax purposes, we take our closing balance, which is now zero, multiplied by, multiplied by 25%, and that will be our deduction. Okay, that's zero for this year. But then we have to add back the 25% that we received in the prior year. Okay, because we've already got 25% of that pink data. But the receiver now says, okay, oh, I see you had some credit losses, so some real rechte achter, rechte achter um, credit losses. So the receiver says, okay, you can get a full deduction for um, these uh, real credit losses. So it's not just that you thought you might have, these are real credit losses. So we're giving you that full deduction. So the, if, the net effect is that for tax purposes, we got the 25% deduction in year one, but then in future, when this data goes bad, we are going to get the remaining 75% deduction in year two. Okay, so let's quickly see um, uh, cash reducing from. Would you say that you also receive benefits in the form of cost of sales? Um, well, your cost of sales. Um, so that was a benefit in the in the sense that you um, deducted that. Okay, Mr. Palafala, I'm not sure if I. Uh, so yeah, we got that as a deduction. So that was a benefit, yes. So I, I suppose you're still referring to the inventory. Um, so that's why I'm saying my closing balance of inventory is in the future going to be um, a, a, a deduction. So I'm going to get a deduction in future um, when I sell those inventories. So yeah, then it will make my tax less for the for the for the next year. But the accounting and the tax treatment is the same.
Okay, so back to the allowance for expected credit losses. So this is the important principle that I want you to understand. That for tax, we get 25% when we create an allowance, and then later on, we are going to get the remaining 75%. Okay, so if we go back to our uh, class example for the allowance for credit losses, um, we will now we are now standing at the end of year one. So we've created this allowance for expected credit losses. So um, we have this balance. So we now have to say, okay, what will be the um, we've got the carrying amount. The, what will be the amount deductible for tax in future? And that is going to be the 75% that will be deductible in future. Okay, so that's our tax base. Okay, so there we go. There's our tra tra gross trade debtors, no temporary difference. Whereas for our allowance for expected credit losses, we've got the temporary difference. Okay, so everyone happy with that? Okay, it's this not, it makes sense now that we have this deductible temporary difference uh, because we are going to get um, a future benefit um, when we deduct the remaining 75%. Whew, there was a hand. I don't think I can actually, because it's a large session. Um, uh, so if you have any questions, just post it in the, in the chat. Good. Moving on then. Um, other current assets. They tell us that my other current assets is um, dividend income receivable, prepaid insurance, and prepaid subscriptions. Oof, yeah, out of time. Um, so, first of all, dividend income receivable is an asset. Uh, so, we have to ask ourselves will the economic benefits from this asset be taxable? So, when this asset now realizes and we actually get that, that dividend income paid out to us, will that be? Um, taxable. So what do you feel about that? Will the dividend income receivable um, uh, economic benefits be taxable? No. Why not? Uh, the reason for that is because uh, uh, when, we, when we get it, dividend income is in any way not taxable at all, but um, uh, whether, the, whether it is when it's paid or whether it is when, we, when it's just um, um, when we have to accrue for it, doesn't matter, it's not taxable. Therefore, the tax base will be equal to the carrying amount. So the tax base is then the same as the carrying amount. Um, okay, everyone happy with that? Exempt income, 100%. Next, we get to our prepaid expenses. So prepaid expenses is an asset because what happened is we, we credited bank to pay the, this uh, prepaid expense. Now, we couldn't debit... Um, um, we couldn't debit our our um, okay. I have to, normally I do it mirror uh, debits and credits. I have to do it mirror because you're looking at me from the front. But I see on the video, yeah, this is actually right. Okay, so we 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 will credit back to pay, and then we have to debit. That's still still mirror. Yes. Okay. Never mind. Okay. Okay. So prepaid expenses and asset. Never mind. It's a debit. Good. Okay. So, will the economic benefits be um, be taxable for this prepaid expense? Um, so, the economic okay. So, we pay prepaid insurance. So, the benefit we are going to get from this prepaid insurance will be the the, the insurance cover that we are going to get in future. And again, insurance cover, we need that to manufacture our pens. If we don't have insurance cover, then we can't. Uh, you know, we are going to have problems if something happens and something goes wrong. So insurance cover is part of the expenses that we need uh, to generate um, uh, this, this income that we are going to be taxed on. Again, the same for, for our prepaid subscriptions. I don't know what we are subscribing to that, but I'm sure we will not just be subscribing to something because it's pretty. Um, and even if we do to make our shop pretty or whatever, we need that uh, if we want to make the, the, the shop pretty or we want these magazines in the, in the foyer or whatever that is, we need that so that people will want to come to our business and buy our pens. So therefore, the economic benefits that we are going to get in future will be taxable. So now the tax base will be the amount deductible for tax in future. You now know about Section 23H, where we first have to look at the periods for which we have uh, made these prepaid expenses, and then uh, we have look at the remaining 
total balance. Good. So section 23H is a limitation. The normal rule for, for a uh, prepaid expense is that we, we can deduct it at the earlier of when it accrues or when we pay that expense. So the normal rule will actually be that we can uh, deduct all our prepaid ex expenses um, in, 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 in our current year. Okay. Uh, when we pay it, even though it's only going to accrue in the future. However, Section 23H says, wait, wait a minute. Like, for example, now we have a perfect example where the, the corporate tax rate has now gone down. Okay, So that means we have, a for, for the current year still, everyone is still going to pay tax at 28%. But then for next year, um, they are going to pay tax at a lower rate. So if you want to try and manipulate your tax expense a little, um, and, and say we did not have the Section 23H, do you agree that you will go and make as, as, as many as possible prepayments in, in the current year for the, pro, for the next year so that you can get the benefits, you can deduct all those um, uh, prepaid expenses in the current year so that your taxable income is, is smaller uh, for the year that you pay, uh, you're paying tax on the higher tax rate. Can you see that? Can you see that that's something that management might want to do, to manipulate their tax expense um, by making prepayments. And that's why we need Section 23H. So the receiver said, okay, no, wait. We have to limit this deduction. Um, we have to put in, some, in place some, some limitations so that people can't just uh, manage that tax expense um, however they want. Okay, move it from, from one year to the other year. So, the, the, so that's why we have this limitation. So for the prepaid expenses, um, normal rule is deduct early of paid or accrual, um, but we can't deduct everything because there's that section 23H limit. So we first go and look at our periods for how many um, months have we made these pre, uh, prepayments. So when are we going to get these economic benefits from these things that we paid for? So uh, for the 25,000 the subscriptions, we can see there that that's only for uh, four months after year end. So that is then within six months. So then the receiver says, okay, no, this is a short period. Don't worry about it. Go ahead, deduct, um, deduct that in the year that, that you pay for it. Okay, so don't worry about the limitation. If it's within a short period, go ahead and deduct it, regardless of what the amount is. However, um, for the 285,000, the prepaid insurance, you'll see that this is for a period longer than six months. It's for eight months. So therefore, we have to go and look at the total, the RAND amount. And yes, Sash said, if it's less than 100,000, oh, it's small fry. I don't worry about it. You can also just use the normal rule and deduct it when you pay for it. But if it's more than 100,000 RAND, which it is in this case, then um, the receiver says, no, wait a minute. You can't use the normal rule. You will only be allowed to deduct it when it actually, um, uh, when that ex uh, expense accrues in the next year. So for the 285,000, the tax and the accounting treatment is exactly the same. Okay, so we won't have, we're not expecting to see any temporary differences for this prime, uh, prepayment. But for the prepaid subscriptions, there is going to be a temporary difference. Okay, because our um, tax base will be the amount that will be deductible in future. So for prepaid insurance, the amount that's going to be deductible for tax purposes in future will be the full um, carrying amount because remember, um, Sash said, no, wait, limitation applies. You can only deduct that next year when that ex expense accrues, um, which is the same as accounting treatment, no temporary difference. With the prepaid subscriptions, it's prepaid for four months. Um, and so the receiver said, no, I'll just use the general rule. Don't worry about it. So it's already been deducted. So although we are going to deduct it in future for accounting purposes as an expense, but for tax purposes, it's already been expensed. So there is no future deductions giving us the temporary difference. Okay. Good. So that's then prepaid expenses. Expenses. Um, is it a benefit because you'll reverse it, which increase your expense, which decrease your profit in the next period? Mr. Armstrong, I'm not sure. Yeah, you probably... If I haven't answered your question by the end, then we can chat about it again. 
Okay, so the next one is cash and cash equivalents. Now, the cash and cash equivalents um, is the same principle as our debtors, actually. So the economic event, this, the, the sale of the pens have already happened. We've already paid tax on that. So now we just have this cash in the bank. So we can go to the bank, withdraw some of that cash so that we have it in our hands. We're not going to have to pay tax again when we withdraw that cash. So the economic benefits uh, will not be taxable. Uh, because remember, it's already been taxed when we when we had the transaction. Um, so therefore, the tax base and the carrying amount is going to be the same. No temporary difference. No future tax effect. Okay. So next, we're getting to our liabilities. So um, you'll see there. There's a, a long-term borrowings, and then there's a short-term portion of the long-term borrowings. And then in the additional information point seven, they tell us that. Um, this is the capital amount of the obligation to the bank. Included in the short-term borrowings amount over here is an interest expense accrual for 50,000 Rand. Okay, so we have to split that out between the, what's, what's the capital amount outstanding versus what is the accrued interest amount outstanding. Now, when we get to liabilities, we don't have to ask ourselves about taxable economic benefits, is it yes or no, whatever. We can just go into our formula. Um, and here the formula is the tax base will be the carrying amount less the amount deductible for tax in future. Good. So for the borrowing cost, the capital balance, um, the um, our okay. So what what this is the, the, our total amount for borrowings now is our long term portion of 1.3 million plus a short-term portion of 250. But remember, we have to remove that accrued interest. So the total amount for borrowings is 1.5 million. Now, the tax base is the carrying amount of 1.5 million, less the amount deductible for tax in future. Now, in future, when I make my payment on the loan, remember that payment is going to have a capital portion and an interest portion. Now, when I make that payment for the capital portion, I'm not going to be allowed to deduct that payment of the capital portion for tax purposes. Yes, the interest I will be able to, um, to deduct, but the capital portion I'm not going to be able to deduct. So this amount is only the capital portion. Always, uh, this will be our um, only our capital amount outstanding. So therefore, the tax base uh, will be the carrying amount less zero that will be deductible in future, giving me a tax of 1.5 million. Okay, and then, um, so no deduction for the capital portion. Now for the interest um, uh, portion, that's our carrying amount is the 50,000, amount that will be deductible in future. Now as I told you, for tax purposes, we um, will be, uh, the interest will be deductible. But the interest will be deductible when it accrues, or earliest of accrue or pay. Okay, so... Um, so therefore, the interest has already accrued during the current year. We were able to deduct it in the current year. So therefore, we will not, next year when we pay that interest, we will not um, be able to deduct it again. So therefore, the amount deductible in future will be zero, giving me then a tax base of 50,000. Okay, so that is what our tax, um, a deferred tax calc will look like for now. No temporary differences because there are no future tax effects. Let's quickly just check these questions, Mr. Mangali. So whenever determining if an asset or liability has a taxable benefit or not, do you have to see if such an asset or liability affects your goods or services in a way? Um, no. Remember, just, just for an asset where we have to ask ourselves, will the economic benefits? Because remember, the carrying amount of an asset is a promise. To, um, to our investors that we will at least get this amount of economic benefits in future from this asset. Okay, so um, uh, so so that those economic benefits that I'm going to get from this asset will they be taxable or not? Um, so 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 that's the question we ask ourselves for an asset, but we don't ask ourselves that for liability because um, the liability does not give a promise of future economic benefit. Good, I hope I answered your question. Otherwise, pop an email to frk300 at up.ac.za. Okay. Um, good, next one. Uh, last one. Well, looks like the last one. Trade and other payables. Here we see our trade and other payables 
is uh, goods and services uh, of 480,000. And then we also have subscription income received in advance. So we had prepaid subscriptions, which was an expense, but we also have people who subscribe to us and then um, we get an income for that. So remember, we said for um, liabilities, we actually have those two types of liabilities and the two different formulas because income received in advance is a different type of liability. So firstly, for the 480,000, um, uh, our, our tax base will be the, the carrying amount, less the amount deductible for tax in future. And for the revenue received in advance, the tax base will be the carrying amount less the amount not taxable in the future. Good, so if we apply that, uh, first of all, to our normal uh, trade and other payables, we'll see that the tax base is now the, um, the carrying amount and the amount that will be deductible for tax in future. When we, that liability is going to be um, uh, cleared from our SFP when we pay those creditors. When we make that payment to the creditors, we won't be able to deduct that payment for tax purposes because we were already able to, to deduct the original um, uh, purchase amount. When we entered into this credit um, uh, purchase transaction, we deducted that already for tax purposes. So when we now later on pay the creditor, we won't be able to deduct that for tax purposes. So therefore, the uh, future deductions is zero and our tax base is the same as our original carrying amount. Good. So then, then for revenue received in advance, um, normal rule again is that we are taxed on the er, um, earlier of accrual or receipt. So when we receive income, even though it does, that income is only will only be recognised as income in the next year for accounting purposes, um, we will be taxed on it in the year that we receive it. Do you agree that we don't need that limitation similar to Section 23H for this for um, income received in advance? How do you feel about that? Do you think is it necessary to have a, a limitation for re, um, income received in advance? So it shouldn't, should be revenue. It should be income received in advance. Sorry. Do you think we, we need a limitation on that? Is that something that um, uh, management can use to manipulate the tax expense? Is it something that they will want to use to manipulate the tax expense? Okay, so first of all, it, um, first of all, they do not have control about when people are going to pay them. Usually people will not pay you in advance. Okay, that's, that's very rare. Um, so you don't have control of whether they do that or not. So you can't um, force that in order to manipulate anything. And secondly, you would also not want to do that because if you do that, then it's, what's going to happen is you are going to um, actually increase your tax, uh, taxable income with that um, income received in advance. Good. So therefore, we don't need that limitation. We just follow the normal rule. The payer of income will have the limitation. Yes, because the, for the payer, for the, that customer who now pays us in advance, for him, it will be a, 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 a prepaid expense. So, yeah, so, so that person, that customer will have the Section 23H limitation. Good. Okay, so there we have our um, carrying amounts and our tax basis and our temporary differences. Makes sense that for trade and other payables, we don't have any temporary differences because there is no future tax effect. And for revenue received in advance, it also makes sense because next, what's going to happen next, we now pay tax on that income uh, received in advance in, in um, uh, the year that we received it. Okay, uh, so next year we, we are going to account for that income uh, for accounting purposes. So our accounting profit is going to be bigger, but we are not going to have to pay tax on it again, so our taxable uh, in, income is going to be lower. So that's why it's, it's, a, it's a benefit to us. It's a, um, a, a, de a deductible temporary difference that we are going to have in future. Okay, so just as we, are, we thought we are finished now with, the, um, uh, with our uh, SFP, all the balances on our SFP, there's another um, class or another section of uh, the additional information telling us that during the year 25,000 was written off as research expenses in the profit or loss. 
Assume, however, that SASH only allows this expenditure to be written off in equal amounts over four years. Now, hopefully you have done the test, you have watched the video, you have read the discussion boards, you have sent your emails, whatever, because we've had a lot of queries on research costs. Make sure you have that warm, fuzzy feeling okay, about research costs. So what's happening here is that for accounting purposes, we wrote it off as an expense, a full amount when, when um, we pay that. But for tax purposes, we are only going to get it as a deduction over the next four years. 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%. 25, 25, 25, 25. Good. So we've already received the first 25,000 um, uh, 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 deduction. Next year, we are going to receive the second year, and then the third, and then the fourth. Okay, so what happened here is that um, uh, it's deducted over four years. We've already received our first year's um, uh, deduction, so therefore the remaining deductions will be the 75% that remains. If we put that in our uh, deferred tax calc, first of all, we will not have a carrying amount because it's already everything has been expensed for accounting purposes already. But we do have a tax base, which is the future deductions, because tax such treats the, this re, these research expenses almost like an asset. So they give the deduction to us over four years. Um, and therefore, yes, we are, next year we are going to be, in the next three years, we are going to have deductions that we can use, that we can set off against other income, other, uh, our other um, accounting profits that we are going to make in the next year. So it's, it's giving us then a, a deductible temporary difference. It's a benefit. We like that. Good. Um, Okay, so what if, now this is not in your example, but I just want to test you a little bit and see if you can, uh, can think about this logically. What if I also told you in this example that in the prior year there were 30,000 research expenses that were in, incurred for the year ended 31 December 20X12. So the prior year we also had research expenses. What will the tax base be now? So obviously we said here that ooh, that, awesome, that there are for, uh, the carrying amount is going to be zero because these research expenses for the current and the prior were written off as expenses, but there were tax. There's still values for a tax base. So what will the tax base be then if we also had research expenses in the prior year that were deducted over four years? Okay. So that means in the current year we would have already had um, two years worth of um, uh, uh, deductions for the prior expense, but we still have two years remaining. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, I see 15,000, yes, so, so 15,000, but that's not the full tax base now. What will be our full tax base for research expenses at the end of the 2013 year? Carrying amount will be zero. What will be the tax base, the full tax base? Okay, there I see something that looks like the right answer. Yes, okay. So the tax, when we calculate the tax base now, we will say, okay, for the 25,000 that was paid in the current year, 75% of that remains. So that's the remaining three deductions that we are going to get. However, for last year's expenses, we've already had two years worth of deductions, so two years, 25% uh, deductions still remain. Okay, so then the total of these two, which I assume is 33750, would have been our tax base. Okay, so but this was just a what if, that's not part of the example, but just so that you understand that. And while we're talking about research expenses, um, what would be the situation if we, our research expenses, uh, if we had our 25,000 expense during the current year, but SARS allows us the 150% deduction. What will our carrying amount and tax base now be for these research expenses? What do you think? What will the carrying amount be? What will the carrying amount be, first of all, for our research expenses that we had, 25,000? Zero. Cool. 
also read a bit. Oops, that wasn't me. That was the cover. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, um, what will the tax base now be? What's our tax base going to be? So the tax base is going to be um, the amounts that will be deductible for tax in future. Okay, think about it. Think about it now. We pay 25%, so for accounting purposes, we expense 100%. But for tax purposes, we're getting 150% deduction. So what is our tax base? Our tax base is the future deductions. Yes, the future deductions will be zero because I've already, for accounting purposes, I expensed 100%. For tax purposes, I also deducted the 100%. And an additional 50%. So there's nothing remaining to be deductible in future. Good. Cool. Okay. So now we have done example three, where we have um, we've got our carrying amounts, we've got our tax bases, and we have calculated what our temporary or oh, now we can calculate what our temporary differences should be. We've actually done that in the example by taking carrying amount less tax base, giving me um, a temporary difference. If the amounts are positive, you, and you think about it, and you'll see, okay, yes, they are taxable temporary differences. If we have a negative amount, you'll see that that, that is a deductible temporary difference um, uh, for the future. Good. Um, okay. So now we are, let me just quickly check the time we have until 15, now that's another 10, 12, 13 20 minutes, however long we want. Good. So um, now we get to the second part of, of um, uh, this recognition now of our deferred tax liability. Because up to now, all we've done, sorry, up to now, all we've done is we've just uh, calculated our temporary differences. Now we are going to go to the next. We take these temporary differences, multiply them by our tax rate to calculate what our tax as deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability should be. And before we can do that, we have to look at our recognition paragraphs in IS-12. Okay, so in IS-12, your recognition paragraph, first of all, uh, paragraph 15 is how do we recognize a deferred tax liability or a deferred tax liability? Okay. So, um, so paragraph 15 in your standard, make sure you look at that and you know where it is and what it says. So first of all, a deferred tax liability shall be recognized for all taxable temporary differences. So we say that when we have a carrying amount of, um, uh, say our carrying amount is 500 and our tax base, no, it's the other way around. Yeah, tax base is, Never mind. Let's start over. Let's say our um, carrying amount is 630,000. Our tax base is 600,000. We had a temporary difference there of 30,000, and we said that is going to be a taxable temporary difference because we are going to get more future economic benefits uh, than for which we will have deductions. So we have a taxable temporary difference over here. Now, paragraph 15 says, for these taxable temporary differences, you can create a deferred tax liability. So we can just multiply that by our tax rate to give us our deferred tax amount. Good. But then it says, except, so there's an exemption. It says, except in the following um, situations. And these situations, first of all, is uh, when uh, uh, at the initial recognition of, of, of goodwill. So first the part A there that says the initial recognition of goodwill. That happens. We're not going to create deferred uh, tax liability. So don't worry about that now. When we get to group statements later in the year, um, we will talk about that. Okay, but then for what we now have to worry about is part B that says um, if this temporary difference over here arose at initial recognition and the transaction was not a business combination, and it also did not affect accounting or tax loss on the date of initial recognition. If that's the case, then what happens is we say, no, this exemption now applies. This exemption applies, that we are not going to, so if that's the case, then we are not going to do this. 
and we are just going to say no. For this item, it's exempt, so therefore no deferred tax on that item. Okay, so let's quickly look at um, class example four. You don't have to look at that, you can just follow me here. But this is going to answer some of those questions that we had. You remember that for land, we said, okay, it's a little bit weird that we now have this, um, this temporary difference uh, because actually there is no temporary difference, no def um, depreciation, no uh, allowances for, uh, for, um, for tax purposes. Therefore, there's no temporary difference. This is weird that we have this over here. And the reason for that is um, how we now fix that. Uh, in our deferred tax calc is with this exemption for, from paragraph 15. Because remember, when we initially recognized land, um, with our initial transaction, we would, when we purchased land, we would have said uh, uh, credit bank, debit land. Okay, so in the, at initial recognition, so I'm not now talking about at initial recognition, we normally do the deferred tax calc at the end, but just now to see whether this exemption applies, we look at initial recognition. When we purchased this land on day one, it would have had a carrying amount. Now, on day one, our future deductions would have still been zero. Therefore, the temporary difference would have arisen on day one for land. Do you agree with that? So because we now, um, because this exemption now applies, um, it arose at initial recognition. Next, we have to ask ourselves, okay, but was this transaction a business combination? No, it wasn't. It was just a purchase of land. And did this transaction affect accounting or, um, or tax profit or loss um, in, the, in the year that it was purchased, so at initial recognition? And no, it didn't. This will never be an effect for tax. And for accounting purposes, the journal was to a credit bank and debit the land. So it did not affect accounting or uh, tax profit or loss. So therefore, what now happens is that we are going to just exempt. So we're not going to multiply this by 28%. We are just going to say, no, sorry, the exemption applies. And you have to write this in your deferred tax calc for me because you are going to get a mark for the carrying amount, mark for the tax base, and then a mark for saying that it is exempt. Okay, so that answers our question um, over here. So now it makes sense. Whatever it is that bothered us there makes sense. Now, do you agree with that? 23 minutes. Okay. Mr. Shrempel is um, generous with me. Good. Um, next one was our factory building. So for our factory building, we had a taxable temporary difference. There was our taxable temporary difference that we calculated. So now we have to think, okay, does the exemption apply? Remember the exemption said, if at initial recognition uh, the temporary difference arose, then we have to look at certain things. So first of all, for this factory building, did that temporary difference arise at initial recognition? So let's think about it. On day one, when we purchased the factory building, the carrying amount would be the original cost, and the tax base will be that full original cost that is going to be given to us as um, uh, deductions in future. Then you see that for the factory building, we do not have um, a, a, a temporary difference at initial recognition, which means if we, our answer here to that first one is no, it did not arise at initial recognition, then it says, okay, the exemption does not apply, so we can just then go ahead and take this 1.8 million so this 1.8 million that we have over here, um, oh, sorry, no, it's 1080, the carrying amount that we have over here, less the tax base, so we can just take that 180, um, so it's 900,000 tax base, so our de um, temporary difference was 180. We can just take this 180, multiply it by 28%, and that's going to give us our deferred tax um, liability amount. Okay, because the exemption does not apply. Okay, for the office building, we have the same situation as for land. So again, it makes sense because when we originally purchased the land, so this was at initial recognition when we purchased the land, our tax base still would have been zero. So it arose at initial uh, recognition, it was not a business combination, and at the in, uh, initial recognition, it did not affect my accounting profit, 
and it also did not affect my taxable income. Okay, so therefore the exemption applies again. Good. Everyone happy with that um, exemption of the deferred tax asset? Ach, deferred tax liability. Okay, I see a smile, smiley face, so that's a good sign. Oh, that reminds me, I forgot about Stu. Stu is not attending class today. I hope Stu is um, going to watch the video later. Or, or, or maybe he's watching the live stream. Good, yes, where's Stu? I'm sorry. I, 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 I don't know where he is. He's maybe sleeping a little bit late. Bad student. Good, okay, next. We've now looked at... Um, recognition of a deferred tax liability. So we now know when do we take our taxable temporary differences and multiply it with 28%. Because you've seen now that although we do that calc for all our assets and liabilities, not all those temporary differences go into the deferred tax column. We don't take all of our temporary differences, multiply by 28 and put them to the deferred tax column. Because some of them will be exempt. Good. Now we look at our deferred tax assets. So that means now we are going to look at situations where our where we had a carrying amount of um, let's say 580 and a tax base of 630, giving us then a, a temporary difference of 50. Yes. Uh, so, so that means uh, a negative temporary difference, so that means it is a um, deductible temporary difference. Okay, a deductible temporary difference is going to give us then a deferred tax asset. But let's see what they say in paragraph 24 for the recognition of a deferred tax asset. Okay, so paragraph 24 looks exactly the same as, as a paragraph 15, just completely different. Okay, so you'll see that there are, there are differences between the two, although it looks the same. Good. Rough night last night, maybe. For Stu, yes, maybe. Stu is feeling sick. Oh, shame. I, I'm, I, I don't believe that. Because Stu is a little bit of a drama queen. Okay, but you never know. I don't know. Can a, a Wednesday night be a rough night for a student? Isn't it normal th normally Thursday night? Okay, going to the strip? I don't know. Anyway. I've never been there. Apparently, I'm not allowed to go. Good. Okay. So let's look at paragraph 24. Oh, it was St. Patrick's Day. You're right. You're right. I'm wearing my green shirt on the wrong day. Okay. Concentrate, Lizette. Focus, focus, focus. Back to work now. Paragraph 24 says that for, uh, uh, says that a deferred tax asset shall be recognized for all deductible temporary differences. So every time we have a negative amount in our temporary difference column, we will recognize a deferred tax asset. But then it says, first of all, there's a limitation that says, only to the extent that it is probable that taxable profit will be available against which the deductible temporary difference can be utilized. So now we have a limitation and we also have the exemption that we had for deferred tax liability. Okay, so the exemption says, unless the deferred tax uh, asset arises from the initial recognition of an asset or liability in a transaction that's not a business combination and at the time did not affect our accounting or tax profit. Okay, so for now, let's just park the limitation. We'll look at that later. And we only focus on the exemption. Good. So, um, over here, in our class example three that we did, we had two uh, deductible temporary differences for our patent and our subscription um, income in advance. And we now have to apply, uh, we have to apply the, ex the exemption, first of all. So, forget about the limitation for now, we apply the exemption. Okay, so for the patent, when it was originally recognized, remember, we have to first now determine that the temporary difference arise at initial uh, uh, recognition. So at initial recognition, when I purchased this patent, the uh, full cost would have been my carrying amount, uh, or they told, sorry, they told me that this is my tax base. Um, 
Oh, sorry, there's the initial recommendation. So I, initially I purchased it for 650 and that full amount I would get as tax deductions in future. So for the patent, no, the um, temporary difference did not arise at initial recognition. Therefore, exemption does not uh, uh, apply. So that means that we can now actually take this taxable uh, temporary difference over here, multiply 28% to get my deferred tax asset. Exemption does not apply because we did not comply with this first rule that says it arose at initial recognition. Happy with that? What does LMAOO stand for? LMAO. Oh. Can you laugh it off twice? Laugh it off and off again. Okay, so good. So we're happy with that for the patent. Uh, next one is the subscription income in advance. Um, so we also have this deductible temporary difference. So at initial recognition, when we receive the um, uh, uh, subscription uh, income in advance, um, we, uh, oh yeah, the full amount for the subscription income is 155,000 uh, rand. Um, at that st so, so at that stage, the tax batch will be the carrying amount less the amount not taxable in future. So that would be our carrying amount of the full income that we received. And the amount that will not be taxable in future will be that same amount because we, will, will, we are taxed actually the moment we receive it. Therefore, the tax base is zero. So here we have a situation where the temporary difference um, arose at initial recognition. Okay, so now it seems that the rose had initial ignition, ignition, so it seems as if this exemption applies. But that's weird because when we looked at it, we said, oh, it makes sense that we have a deductible temporary difference. We didn't have, do, 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 don't know what to do about it. So why, it seems now as if the exemption applies. But does the exemption really apply? Because remember, we also have to look at, was the transaction a business combination? No, it wasn't. And then number three, did the transaction affect my accounting profit or my tax taxable income at initial recognition? So let's see, at initial recognition, when I received this full amount of income, I would have said debit bank with a full 155,000. And then I would have said, and now for, for the income when I received it, okay, now it would have gone to income received in advance, it's also SFP. Okay, so accounting profit, no. Accounting profit was not affected. However, when we received that money, we already got the, um, uh, uh, the tax deduction. So that means that this transaction did affect my, uh, my taxable profit, taxable income. So because it does not comply with this rule number three, the exemption does not apply. So the exemption does not apply, so we can actually go and take this taxable temporary difference, multiply it by 28% to get to my um, uh, deferred tax asset. Okay. Maybe it was a typo. What's, what, what typo did I make? Oh, the O, oh, the extra O. Oh. Okay, Mr. Marcusi, I think you made a typo. Or otherwise, you should maybe don't tell us what the extra O is for. Okay, maybe don't. Maybe don't. Okay, so that's it. That's um, that's our, our lecture for today. That's the plan of what I wanted to do with you for today. Oh, no, wrong one. This one. Okay, so let's quickly, well, we have a few more minutes left. Uh, I can't remember exactly now what I told you to do for homework. I think you can now go and complete question one. Uh, parts, I think it's what B and C and D. Uh, you can go and complete uh, question one of the homework questions, and you can also go and um, <laughs> you can also go and uh, I think there might be other homework questions that you can use as well. And please go and look at these examples again. So the explanations in the examples. Uh, might, might be a little bit different to the way I explained it in class. So if there's still something that you, you don't have that warm, fuzzy feeling again, or, or yet, please go and look at those examples in your notes and make sure that you are, you are comfortable with that. Question 1C and question 2B. 
Okay, Miss Marie, yes, you can, I'll assign you the responsibility of always telling us what our homework is, because I set up that online activities plan a week ago, I can't remember what I said there. I'm oh, really enjoying the live streams, I'm so happy about that. Okay, maybe we just, we need some music, just because you are enjoying it so much, what do you think? Hmm? Should I play you some music? I, I'll play you that, my, my favorite song again. My children hate it. Okay, but I do play it for them six o'clock in the morning, so that's maybe not a good idea. Good. Now I just have to fix this up. Okay, so um, the on. Yes, please, let's rave. No COVID at the strip. COVID sleeps between six and zero. Yeah. Oh, so I can we can go to the strip, but I'm not allowed to go. It's student night pre-party now in class. Yes, on my piano. Ooh, I think I have that. I think I actually have that. Um, when will the live session recordings be available on ClickUp? They, after the session, after I've now stopped the recording, um, it, takes a, it takes a while because it's a long video. So it's going to take a few minutes to download into, into Blackboard. And then we go, we have to go and uh, copy paste it to the um, um, Google Drive. So it does take a while, but um, yeah, I, I, it will happen. Good. So um, let's see. I'm sure, I'm sure I have on the piano. Hmm. No, I don't. I've got another one. Okay, let me stop the um, recording. If you're watching the recording, you're welcome to go and play on my piano yourself. Um, but for now, I'm just going to stop it. Okay, so that it, this cannot um, um, uh, be posted to you.